From historic downtown Waco, deep in the heart of Texas, this is First Sunday Morning, a ministry of the First Baptist Church of Waco. A part of our community, celebrating fellowship together and sharing ministry with others through the timeless good news of the gospel story of new life in Christ Jesus. Good morning, and welcome to First Baptist Church of Waco. My name is Witten Weems. And I'm his brother, Peyton. We have been members of this church for two years. One of the reasons I like this church is because of the summer day camp. Your kids can sign up and they will learn sports including football, softball, soccer, archery, track and field, and volleyball. Also, art, baking, and other fun things, plus breakfast and lunch. This month is Worship Explorers Month, where kids get to help lead in the church services. So be on the lookout for kids like us. If you are a guest here today, we ask that you please fill out the tear-off section in your bulletin and place it in the offering plate as it goes by. Or you can take it to the foyer after the service and pick up a free gift bag on your way out. Now stand up and greet one another.
I'd like to invite the children to join me for the children's message. Good morning. How are y'all? You doing well? You doing okay? All right, very good. Normally on Sunday mornings, I bring a little something up here as an illustration. Today, you all brought the illustration with you. Today, we're going to talk about your hands. Put your hands up like this. Let's see if they'll do it too. So, see your hands. Everybody got some hands going on here? Uh, hands do things. We can clap with hands. Let's do some clapping. Oh, very fantastic. Uh, we can, you, can you snap? Do you know how to snap? You know how to snap? Uh, these opposable thumbs are great, aren't they? I mean, this is, this is, thank you, Lord, for the opposable thumb. Uh, you get, you know, like tools. This is our, our, our tools. This is what we use to do things all the time. We write our name, and, and uh, we eat our lunch, and, and we hug our friends, and, and we, we use our hands. Our hands are important. Uh, sometimes we even use the hands as like a figure of speech. Has anybody ever said to you, hey, lend me a hand? Give me a hand. Only Amelia Bedelia would actually hand over a hand. I mean, that, that, just, means, that just means give me some, some what? Some help. Some help. Today we're going to read a passage of Scripture that talks about the hand of the Lord. Now that sounds kind of weird and spooky, like God has ring sizes and stuff. That's not what the Bible's talking about. That's talking about how God helps us, how God's at work and God's alive. So I want you to pay attention as we learn about that later today, okay? Let's pray together. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for loving us, and we thank you for joy and life, and we thank you that you're alive and that you're good and that you're working in this world. Lord, we ask you indeed to give us a hand. Lord, we ask you uh, to be yourself and to do your work and draw people to yourself, even as we join in with you. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for loving us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great morning. See y'all later. I would like to teach you a little tune, a little bit of country. It's found in your order of service called the Mountain of the Lord. I'm going to sing a phrase, and uh, then we'll have you sing it. It goes like this. Let us go. Let us go. Let us go to the mountain of the Lord. Try it with me. Let us go, let us go, let us go to the mountain of the Lord. Super. Now the next place. For the word God will send from Jerusalem. For the word God will send from Jerusalem. And it finishes off. Let us go to the mountain of the Lord. Right? Let us go to the mountain of the Lord. Okay, so the choir and I will sing the stanzas, and then you come in on that refrain each time. Starts off like this. There's a road that winds up a mountainside Far from the valley below That the people from all the world around Climb up to the high plateau. Let us go. Let us go. Let us go to the mountain of the Lord. For the word God will send from Jerusalem. Each step will keep climb until we reach the journey's end till we rest our eyes upon the prize waiting for us just around the bend let us go let us go Yeah. 
Isaiah 6, 1 through 5. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is fill, full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The passage is remarkable because it tells us what the service order is like in heaven before the throne of God. And it also tells us the words they sing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Ancient words. No, not that. Eternal words. Words that have always been before the throne of God. Years ago, they were set to music by Franz Schubert. You'll find it is hymn number 10 in your hymnal. Listen as the choir sings it once, and then we will join the host of heaven and angels as well, singing to God.
Join me in, please join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for this day you have given us. As a whole congregation, we trust and do everything in your name. As we give this offering to you, Lord, please take it to places in need and bless the people with your love and righteousness, just like you are doing to everyone here at FBC Waco. In your heavenly name we pray, amen.
Let's pray together. Our good and our holy God, we are truly grateful for your guiding hand. We pray now, Lord, that you would lead on, that you would lead us and guide us and direct us, that you would speak. Speak, Lord, for your servants, we're listening. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord, saying together, amen, amen. Please be seated. As you're seated, why don't you find a copy of Scripture and turn with me to Acts chapter 11. Our focal text today is Acts 11, 19 to 30. We're continuing the series, Unhindered Witness. Now those who were persecuted were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad, and he encouraged them all that with one purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So that it was a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And in these days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. This is quite a page. This story marks a major shift in the growth of the gospel. We've been talking about this unhindered witness, and we'd seen how the, the gospel began to flourish and bear fruit in Jerusalem, and then in, among the Samaritans. And then we had that great encounter with that singular man uh, from Ethiopia last week, and now we see it continually, continually expand and grow, refusing to be hindered. How exciting. How, how wonderful. If you ask me to list the books that have influenced my life, in the very top category, in the top five books, would have been Frank Stagg's commentary on the book of Acts. As a Southern kid growing up, and somebody handed me that book years ago, my life, my life was impacted in such a way because he picks up on this, this very last word in, in the book of Acts, this word unhinderedly, strange word, and he talked about God's explosive power and how God would not be hindered by the things that just held us in shackles. And in his commentary, when it came to this chapter, he said this, unhindered was his thrilling theme. And he says, no one can truly appreciate it except as he too is liberated. Liberated from what? Liberated from sin, from self, from narrow nationalism, from provincialism and particularism, from racial pride, from prejudice. As he finds himself in Christ Jesus related to humanity and to 
eternity. This chapter of Scripture is a liberating chapter because it liberates us from our sin and the sin that we stare in the mirror every morning, the unredeemed self that seeks to be the Caesar in our heart that breaks the world up into such tiny little pieces that it almost completely disappears. Unhindered witness. What a story. What a page in the Bible. We could spend a lot of time here, but you have lunch reservations. So I want to just linger over two ideas, two concepts that I think are very, very vital that are unimportant. And that's that the unhindered gospel changes us now and for eternity. And that when you come to this text of Scripture, jumping off the page are the concepts of the hand of the Lord. How does God liberate us? Through the hand of the Lord. And also the concept of having a heart for the Lord. The hand of the Lord and a heart for the Lord. The hand and the heart. Let's begin with this idea of the hand of the Lord. Verse 21, it says, And the hand of the Lord was with them. This is God's immediate presence and power and help. Why did they do what they did? Why, why did the result occur as it did? Because God was alive and God was working and God was in the midst of them. He said the hand of the Lord was with them. This text of Scripture begins to name names and leave some names out. But let's talk at least about the categories of people for whom the hand of the Lord was present and real. The first I think we have to think about is Stephen. He shows up in verse 19. He's already dead. But, but it starts off talking about Stephen and, and the fact that they are here because of what happened to Stephen there. And if you remember back in earlier chapters of Acts, Stephen is passionately committed to Christ. He is passionately committed to the gospel. And it puts him... In the crosshairs of those who had a vested interest in the status quo. And Stephen was called on the carpet. And there, as his life hung in the balance, he took that opportunity to proclaim the unfettered, unhindered message of Christ Jesus. He told the whole story of his people. And he said that Christ was their Messiah. That he was killed for their sins, but that he was alive. And God, in his grace, gave Stephen a vision of Christ in his glory. We know that Jesus was seated at the right hand of the Father, but the story is told that as, that as, as it's pulled back and, and as, as he's able to see, Jesus is standing. He's standing. And he looks and he sees him. After his sermon ends, he sees the Lord high and lifted up and standing and looking. And then he gave his life for his love of Jesus. A young man named Saul held the garments of those who cast the stones. The hand of the Lord. The hand of the Lord was present in Stephen's life. He said, I thought if the hand of the Lord was present, then we would be healthy, wealthy, and wise, and all of the lines would fall to us in pleasant places. Say, what about Stephen? God forget about Stephen. No, no present and there and empowering him to bear witness even as he gave his life. As a pastor, I often officiate funerals. I've done quite a few recently. I have one tomorrow and one of the things that I sometimes do is I, is I ask if I can borrow their Bible to use it in the service. 
I remember when my grandfather died, I asked my grandmother, uh, I was to officiate his service, the toughest one I've ever done. I loved him, that man, and he loved me. And I asked my grandmother, and she said, Sugar, I don't know if it'll help you much. He wasn't much of a note taker. I said, well, Reed, I'd love to have it anyway. And so I got my grandfather's Bible, and I went through it. And, and he had underlined about four passages in the entire Bible. Two of them were about having courage to speak. My grandfather was a very bashful man. Uh, and as a, as a young deacon in the church, he was called on to teach boys Sunday school, and it scared him to death. World War II wasn't a big deal for him, but teaching boys Sunday school, that was, that was an issue. And so he, he was highlighting those passages about having courage to speak. And then, then he underlined a few passages about people that really impressed him. Stephen was one of them. And, and that story of Stephen where Stephen looks at those people and, and he, he says, don't hold this against them. Forgive them. Forgive them. My granddaddy wrote, just like Jesus. Just like Jesus. Jesus. You see, Stephen was a witness that experienced the hand of the Lord and the power of God's grace empowered him to witness just like Jesus. And that witness had a long fuse on it. You know, after his martyrdom, there wasn't an altar call. No one said the bustles of wait. Nobody sang just as I am long fuse the goads that kicked against the persecutor that would become the apostle grace the hand of the Lord that's just the first person we see in this text there's others it says those that are scattered those that were slung to the wind as they went, what did they do? They went telling the story, and they went to the kind of people they knew. They went and told the story to Jews. And the hand of the Lord was present in their life, and, and many of those people came to faith in the Lord Jesus. And then there is a sentence that says, some of them. What, what a designation. Some of them. Some of them from Cyprus and Cyrene, the islanders and the Africans, some of them began to share with the Gentiles as well. When I was a kid, I used to trade baseball cards, and, uh, and, and every now and then you'd get in a deal with somebody where, you, where it was kind of like almost an even trade, but you needed to sweeten the pot a little bit to get it. So you'd say, I will trade you my Will Clark for your Raphael Palmero, and I'll throw in three no-names. You know what a no-name is? It's a guy playing Major League Baseball that very few people know their name. They're on the rosters. They're getting it done. But they're not the stars. Some no names. Some of them. You know, the gospel has traveled on the backs of no names ever since the beginning. And here, one of the biggest moves in the history of the church, one of the biggest, one of the biggest breakthroughs in the gospel carried on the back of some of them some no names from the island and from Africa and as they started telling the story to those Gentiles you know what happened the hand of God was there the strength of the Lord was there and they were converted unto Christ the witness was unhindered because God was there. What does the hand of the Lord do? The hand of the Lord empowers evangelism. At the very end of the book of Acts, uh, Paul is standing uh, and he's telling the story again, this time in the halls of power. And he says in, in chapter 26, verse 22, Therefore, having obtained help from God... To this day I stand witnessing both the small and great, saying no other things than those things which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Why were the Gentiles converted when some of them began to share the gospel? Because Christ himself was proclaiming light. The Spirit of Jesus was proclaiming the gospel through those, through those some of them. It was the work of the Lord. 
It was the work of God. Paul would often talk about how we received help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the opening lines in, in Philippians. And here you have the power of God empowering the witness of the church. And it was beautiful to behold. The hand of the Lord was present in this chapter of Scripture to empower evangelism and also to encourage the church. When word got out about the conversion of these Gentiles in Antioch, when it spread back to Jerusalem, they sent Barnabas. I think by sending Barnabas, that's a good indicator that this wasn't some kind of going to go check the paperwork. I mean, he, he's, a, he's an encouraging person. He's a, he's, he's a, a wise person. So that they sent Barnabas to see what was going on because the church needs to be encouraged. And Barnabas went to see and to encourage. And he said when he saw the grace of God in the midst of them, he was filled with joy. He celebrated and he pled with them, he admonished them that with a heart they would cling to the Lord and continue on with the Lord. The hand of the Lord is present within the body of Christ because we all need encouragement. I think our default mechanism is discouragement and fear and doubt and defeat. And we need the hand of the Lord in our midst to bring about courage. This is a Super Bowl day. I, I would be fired as a pastor if I didn't tell one football story. It's expected of us today. <laughs> so here it goes. This past season, I was helping coach Wes's little, uh, little flag football team for school. Uh, I was kind of the coach of encouragement. I wasn't drawing up the plays. I was just kind of hanging out, talking to the kids. And, uh, and we were in a game where we were playing kids that were one grade above them. Now, when you're a middle-ager, one year doesn't matter much, but, but when it's a difference between fifth and sixth grade or fourth and fifth grade, that's quite a deal. So all Wes's little team, they were out there, and everybody else was about a foot taller, and, you know, and they, the other team had tattoos and deep voices and all that. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they were beating us bad. Uh, they were beating us. We were down. We were down a couple of, couple of scores going into the half. But right at the, end, right at the end of the first half, our kids did something great. I mean, just our little fast guy ran out and ran fast, and our quarterback hit him on the pass, and they scored. And so we cut, we cut their big lead down just a little bit. And our guys were so excited, and, and, I, and I, I pulled them over there. I said, all right, guys, it's the second half. I said, I want you to look at those guys. I said, they're bigger than you. They're faster than you. They're beating you. A lot of them are better looking than you. No, I didn't. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't say that to those kids. Uh, but it was true. And uh, <laughs> I said, kids, come here, look at me. I said, look at me. Did you see what happened with that last play? Did you see what happened? Not on the field, but in their eyes. Did you see what happened in their eyes? No. Let me tell you what happened in their eyes. I said, you put a little doubt in their eyes. I mean, I was like Newt Rockney. I was Grant Taft. I was the bear. I said, I said, you put some doubt in their eyes. I said, guys, you know what? You know what follows doubt in the eye? What? I said, fear in the heart. I said, you know what happens after fear gets in your heart? You're defeated. I said, guys, you have already managed to put doubt in their eyes, and it's moving toward fear in their heart. I said, let's go out there and win this game. And I, I mean, I was ready to like charge hell with a water pistol. And uh, I mean, I was ready to roll. And, uh, and so those kids come out and we actually beat those sixth grade boys. How? <laughs> so there's your football story for today, all right? Uh, but here's the deal. As a church, as a church, as the people who are to be the witness for Christ, there's an entropy that sets in. There is a default that sets in. And that's to walk through the world with doubt in our eyes, lacking confidence in the reality that God is alive and good and for us and wants to work in us, among us, and through us to bear witness to the aliveness of Jesus throughout the earth and among our friends and neighbors. We forget about the hand of God. We forget about the help of the Spirit of Jesus. We walk through the world with doubt in our eyes, and it floods our hearts with fear. 
And from day one, Barnabas showed up because he wanted their eyes, their eyes full of faith and hope. He wanted them to have a heart that clung to the Lord. Friends, the hand of God is reality. God's help is reality. And God's help has been pushing the church to the margins from the very beginning, bearing witness in word and deed to the aliveness of Christ. The hand of God is true. Here's what's in question is will, will we have a heart, a burning heart for the Lord? That's what Barnabas encouraged. And so the question is, how do we know if we have that? What, was, what does it look like? Well, I think we have to look at the example of Barnabas himself, the description that Luke used to describe him. Here was a man who was encouraging people to have the heart for the Lord because he himself had a heart for the Lord. How did the Bible describe him? Well, it described him first as a good man. You've read from good to great. Perhaps you ought to read from great to good. He was a good man. He was a good man. What does that mean? Well, it, one, at least it means he was humble. Look at the humility. I think it was Calvin who pointed out that, that he could have remained preeminent as a leader. But what did he do? He went and he got Paul. He went and he got Saul, and he brought him back, and he built that, that one up. Here was a man who cared the most about the preeminence of Jesus. It just came out of his life. He was a good and humble man. Uh, he was also generous. We know this. We, he was a giver. He wanted to meet the needs of other people, and he was not stingy. Hebrews 13, 16 says, Don't forget to do good and share with others. Barnabas did not forget that. He was a generous, humble, kind man. Why? Because he had a heart for the Lord, and he knew the hand of the Lord. He was spirit-filled. It said he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit. We have to lay our lives before God in honest prayer and admit that we are weak and that he is strong. And ask him to fill our life with his presence, with his breath. Ask him to extend his hand in our midst and do what only he can do. That happens in prayer. That happens in faith. And that's the last thing. He was faith-filled. He was filled with faith. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, Without faith is it impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. And how does He reward us? With riches and treasure, with a good name. It's business. It's God's business as to how he rewards. I can tell you this. I know for certain that he rewards us with his presence and with his power. Do we want to please God as a church? I think we would answer yes. Do we want to please God as individuals? I think we would answer yes. That's what we want. How do we do it? We look with eyes of belief and trust. We believe that he exists, that he's real, that he's alive. Y'all, if he, if he wasn't, there'd be a lot better ways to spend your time on a Sunday morning. Don't turn your back on this for the church of the covered dish. Go do something else. But if he's real, it's got to make a difference. If he exists, it's got to make a difference. Do you believe he exists? If that's true, do you believe he's rewarder of those that seek him? That if you offer him your heart, he gives you his hand. He gives you his help. If we will humble ourselves and ask for his help and give him our hearts, I believe there's no end to what he will do in this earth for his glory and for the good of others. That's living an unhindered witness. 
God, you're good and you've been very good to us. You demonstrated your love for us and while we were powerless, sinful, you sent Christ to give us life. Lord, for those of us who know you in that relationship of salvation, we give you thanks and praise. And we pray, Lord, that the witness of our church would be a witness of deed and word as we proclaim the words of Jesus and we do the deeds of Jesus through the help of the Spirit of Jesus. Lord, stir in our midst a renewing, a renewing presence and power. Oh Lord, I pray for those who are, who are hearing this and paying attention to this today that don't know you. I pray, God, that, that even now as you're drawing them to yourself, that they would open up their lives. Lord, I pray for some that, that they would begin to start thinking about you, whether they're watching this on television or on a computer screen somewhere or they're sitting right here on this corner. Lord, do your work in and through us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Friends, let's stand and let's sing our hymn of commitment. If you have made commitments to the Lord in the privacy of your heart that you would make today in public, we invite you to come for the glory of God and for your good. David? You may be seated. I'll accept the McNutt family. I want to invite y'all to come and join me here. This is Ryan and Laura and Mary Allison McNutt. Uh, the McNutts have been visiting with us here for several weeks now and have come forward to join our church. And so we, we welcome you and we rejoice in that decision. If you will join me in welcoming them and, and not only in welcoming them, but in agreeing to support them and love them and, and encourage them as they grow in their walk with Christ. Would you say amen with me? Amen. amen. Ryan and Laura, Mary Allison, uh, we're going to invite all of you to remain up here as we close. People will want to come by and greet you. And uh, now Robin is going to come with one of our worship explorers to bring our benediction. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Thank you.